testing one, two, three. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Before we get started, I'm just going to give everybody a few minutes to get online. Uh, for those of you who are already connected, welcome to the first um, online CanSage webinar for 2021. It's an exciting year. It's the year that we end the COVID pandemic. Um, and there's no better way to start the year than an exciting webinar that will look at self-improvement uh, for the surgeon, that being yourself. So I'm just going to give everybody just a, a minute or two as I see the numbers rise for all our registrants. And again, thank you for taking a Monday evening off in this new year to be with us and to be with CanSage. And some housekeeping uh, things as well as you're getting registered. Just remember, we're happy to have you ask any questions through the Q&A um, rather than the chat function. So that's at the bottom. Many of you ha do text me, and so I've got my phone next to me as well. And we're happy to, uh, I'm happy to take discussion points that way as well. So make yourself uh, comfortable. <clears throat> So for those of you just joining us, we're giving everybody a minute to just get logged on. Um, grab yourself a drink, grab yourself a snack for CanSage's first online educational seminar for 2021. It's also important to note as a CanSage member, these webinars are included. And next month we'll have uh, Dr. Ted Lee with us, who will be going over some uh, tips for dissection for complex surgery. Perfect, so I see the right number of registrants there. So I'm gonna get started. So again, I'd like to welcome everybody to the first online webinar uh, for CanSage in 2021. Again, the exciting year that the pandemic comes to an end, right? We're looking forward to uh, not only finally getting together, I hope later this year, but in the meantime, we can connect through these online educational seminars. Uh, last year, I had the opportunity to propose a couple of speakers and our guest speaker today was uh, top of my list. So I look forward to introducing her in a moment. Um, but first of all, I do wanna thank the CanSage Board of Directors and the Online Educational Planning Committee, Drs. Catherine Allaire, Jamie Croft, John Teal, Elizabeth Miazga as well. Our corporate sponsors who help support and make this happen include AbbVie, Allergan, Hologic, Pfizer, and Tercera. I'm really excited to have our partners with us to help, but they aren't actually involved in the educational content. Rather, they've supported uh, bringing what's very important to gynecologists across Canada uh, to these webinars and information that we can provide. Um, the CanSage administrative team, I would like to thank as well, uh, Murray and Lisa, and they're here to support us technically uh, throughout the meeting. If you have any issues or concerns, please let me know um, through the uh, Q&A or chat function, or just text me as well. And I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Sony Singh. I'm a professor in gynecology at the University of Ottawa, and I focus on minimally invasive gynecology. I also help run the AGL fellowship at our site. And um, as part of that, oh, well, that's how we got to meet uh, Dr. Kara King, who I'm going to introduce now. So our presenter for tonight's webinar is Dr. Kara King. Uh, she is got a great uh, bio, so I'm going to go through it a little bit. She told me to keep it short, but it's hard. Uh, so she's a member of the Cleveland Clinic section of minimally invasive gynecologic surgery. She's the director of benign gynecologic surgery 
and the Director of Innovation and Associate Program Director for their MIGS Fellowship. She, created, uh, she completed her residency training at Tufts University, uh, Bay State Medical Center in OBGYN, and then she did a fellowship in MIGS at McGee Women's Hospital with Dr. Ted Lee, and again, a little plug that he'll be with us next month. She has a master's in med medical education. She's been on the executive board for the AGL Fellowship Board, as well as the SGS also. One of the exciting things she hosts is a collaborative podcast called Gynecologic Surgeons Unscrubbed. The main um, reason that we've invited her is to talk about surgical coaching, and she serves on the executive board of the Academy for Surgical Coaching and is a certified surgeon coach through the Academy. She's going to definitely give you some more information on that, so I'll leave that to her. And of course, the, one of the most impressive things is that Dr. King is a two-time recipient of the Golden Laparoscope Award and has actually worked on the APCO CREOC um, Scholars Program as well, uh, which really complements the educational component um, of her background as well. So without further ado, uh, I look forward to hearing from Dr. King, our special guest speaker today. Reminders to ask questions in the Q&A. And also, uh, if you have any technical issues, let me know. We are recording, so you can watch this later on as well. Welcome, Dr. King. Thank you so much, Sony. It is so fantastic be, to be here. Truly an honor to host the first webinar this year for you guys um, at CanSage. Tremendous thank you to you and all of the, the, the administrative um, uh, staff that you guys have at CanSage. You guys have been absolutely fantastic. So thank you again. I am really excited to be here. So just like Dr. Singh stated, today I'll be talking about surgical coaching, which is one of my huge passions and why we need this now. And just like Sony um, stated as well, if you have any questions as we get going, please use the Q&A. We'll try to talk um, to bring up all those questions at the end. And I'd really love a robust discussion at the end um, to talk about some of the things uh, that I review over the next about 30 or 35 minutes or so. So I have no financial relationships to disclose. Uh, just like Dr. Singh stated, I am on the executive board of the Academy for Surgical Coaching. I do want to state, though, that this is a nonprofit organization and I, re and I get no financial uh, reimbursements from them. Um, we will get into the Academy's work, but if you do become a coach through the Academy, you do get paid for that. Um, but I do not get any of that money. I put it all back into the Academy. So my objectives for today are to talk about the current gaps in surgical education for surgeons in practice. I then I want to go into surgical coaching and how it differs a little bit from mentoring as well as teaching. And then I'm going to identify actions to effectively integrate surgical coaching principles into your busy practice and how it can really augment personal performance as well as well-being as a physician. So I have a few questions that we're going to uh, distribute throughout, throughout the next uh, 30 minutes. So this is my first poll question here. Um, so my first question is, if you could bring that up, is have you ever hired a coach to help you outside of surgery or medicine? And this can be in sports, this can be in leadership or, or music. Uh, the, the, the options are uh, A, yes, B, no, but I'm not interested, or C, no, but I really want one. So as you think about this question, I want you to think about all the areas that you've seen coaching before, right? Athletics is a really obvious place to have coaching. Music, another really obvious place. But you can hire coaches anywhere in your life, right? yoga, photography, um, like we stated, leadership, any area that you can think about, you can probably hire a coach. So you guys, your answers are in. So remarkably, 71% of you stated that you've hired a coach somewhere outside of medicine before. 6% has, uh, has not hired a coach and not really interested in that. And then 23% of you said, I do not have a coach in another area, but I really would love one. So this shows that a lot of us are already utilizing coaches in our lives outside of surgery. And when I think about this idea of coaching, right, we hire coaches to help us through maybe things that we're not very good at or things that we want to improve in. But here are some familiar faces that a lot of you may recognize, right? We have Elon Musk, we have Indra Nui, who's a former uh, CEO of PepsiCo, and then we have Tim Cook. So these are experts in their field, right? Top business people in the world and the one thing that all three of these people have in common is they have coaches. They have coaches to hone their skills, make them more effective at what they do. So when I think about surgical coaching, not only do we utilize coaching in areas outside of medicine, in things that we want to get better at, 
people oftentimes also use coaching when they're already experts in their field to take them to the next level. So this again made me reflect a little bit. So this is me and my mother. My mother um, is actually a professional coach for, for athletics. She trains high-end athletes, um, specifically in marathons and in triathlon training. She herself is an amazing athlete. She's competed at Kona. This is us a couple of years back when we uh, ran the Boston Marathon together. And she has really showed me what what you can do with a coach. She has taken me from, you know, running maybe a four hour marathon to qualifying for Boston with a 320. So she really showed me what it means to take a coach, see where you are, have self-reflection, have feedback, have action planning and where it can bring you. So again, this made me think about my area in surgery, right? We as surgeons operate on patients and we have a direct impact on their outcomes. So if we're hiring coaches outside of our, of our place in medicine, then, then why are we not bringing that into the operating room? Why is surgical culture not bringing that into the norm of what we do every single day? So the next thing I wanna talk about is training. So here in the States, we have um, uh, OBGYN together, right? And it made me look at what is the proportion of time that OBGYN residents spend in obstetrics versus GYN in most residency programs in the States. And what we found was that on average, the average OBGYN resident who spends four years in their residency training spends 17 months in GYN and 31 months in obstetrics. It's like, wow, that is just so skewed, right? And during their time in GYN, they're not just doing surgery, right? We're oftentimes doing the full depth and breadth of primary care menopause care, right? Um, just normal primary care type things where not, not that 17 months isn't just focused within surgery. Now, if you go to a tracked residency program, so the only tracked residency program that we have in the States is here at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. And if you take all of your tracking blo blocks and devote them to GYN, you can get up to 25 months of gynecology and 23 months of obstetrics, which, which is a lot more even. And in my opinion, we don't have, uh, we do have some data in regard to GYN skills coming out, but we need more robust data that that does make a difference in surgical skill. Now, when, when you're training in any OBGYN residency program, there's different ways that we can gauge surg surgical skill when we get out, right? How we gauge proficiency. So most institutions, we have case minimums, right? This is an example of um, case minimums with average cases on the left and then the year on the bottom. And you can see that um, we in the States recently has bumped up our case minimums and actually almost 50% of residencies can't actually meet their TLH minimums right now, but we have some case minimums. We have some kind of manual skill. So we recently um, implemented FLS skill passing as a requirement to get through residency. So we have some type of manual skill and then we have some type of, um, of written feedback, right? Some type of milestones where we, where we grade people, maybe level one through level five on how they're doing specific things. Now we could have a whole, you know, talk on assessment and if these actually extrapolate to, to improve skill in the OR. But regardless of that, this is typically what we look at to get people out into the world and put up their signposts. We have some type of case minimums and then some manual skills and then some feedback. And then we get people the stamp of graduation. And then where do we go from there? We get out and we are on our own to kind of figure out how we maintain that skill and how we improve that skill. Now, the way we oftentimes do this is with cert certain societies, right? A lot of us belong to um, multiple different societies and what do we do through them? Um, there's oftentimes some really great uh, post-grad courses that we can look into. So maybe we go to AAGL, um, we think, you know, I wanna get better at let's say laparoscopic suturing, I'm gonna sign up for this four hour post-grad course. Oftentimes we fly to some beautiful place such as Vancouver um, and we maybe spend a weekend learning a specific skill or a new, um, a new procedure that we want to implement. We do that for maybe four hours. Maybe we get lucky and we do that for maybe a two day course. And then we're expected to go home and apply that skill. Now, what happens if we don't have a procedure that actually takes that skill and lets us use it for a couple of weeks or a couple of months? What happens if what we trained and practiced with at the conference isn't actually the equipment that we have at home. This can make it very, very difficult to actually implement and make this a sustainable practice change 
within our surgical uh, toolbox, right? So to really have sustainable change, we really have to be doing this deliberate practice, doing it on a regular basis, having some feedback and having some action planning. And so the current model that we have to learn new skills or to improve our skills can be quite difficult. Furthermore, to do this, we have to have some self-assessment, right? And self-assessment is really important because accurate self-assessment is how we do this self-directed learning. And this is how we really um, figure out what we need to get better at when we go to these type of conferences or post-grad courses or webinars or things like that. An accurate self-assessment allows us to know our strengths. It empowers us to act with appropriate confidence when we have the skills to do so. It also helps us identify our weaknesses, right? We have to know when we are not strong in a certain area, and that way we can go to these um, different um, areas and have these educational ac activities, um, or we have to limit our practice. So having this very accurate self-assessment is really critical in keeping patients safe and really allowing us to strengthen um, or improve areas of weakness. But how do you guys think we are at self-assessment? I will tell you how we are at self-assessment. We're bad. We are really terrible at self-assessment. And studies have found this, and what we have found that this is actually independent of your level of training, your subspecialty, your domain of self-assessment, or the manner of comparison. And what's even more interesting to me is that those who perform the poorest by external assessment also self-assess less well. So think about that. Those of us who are performing the weakest in a certain area also don't have a, have a very strong self-reflective process about that. And that can actually be pretty scary when you think about it. So in my opinion, it's really time to reflect and shift. It's time to pause, look at how our current model is really um, helping us become better surgeons and, and switch this. So in my mind, we really need to look at continuous practice development. So surgical skills should continue to improve even once competency is reached. So once we get that stamp of graduation and we are proficient or competent to do a specific procedure, I really think that we need to continue to enhance our surgical skills, to hone our craft, to keep our patients safe and really elevate surgical care for all of the women. This really needs to be learner driven. It needs to be interactive and it needs to be reflective. This is how adults learn, right? We wanna be the driver of the ship. We really, as adults, want to apply whatever we're learning immediately or quickly. That's just the way that adults learn, and that's how we um, integrate new procedures or, or enhance certain skills that we have. We need to have formative evaluations, and we need a long-term curriculum. I really think we need to move away from these four-hour, six-hour, maybe two-day postgrad courses and really look at a long-term, sustainable way to really integrate enhanced skill in our practice. Now, this isn't necessarily a new concept, right? So I have my second question here. If we could put out my second polling question, that'd be fantastic. So my question for you guys is surgical coaching. This is where I'm gonna go next, as you guys are probably picking up. So I'm just curious, are you guys familiar with coaching principles and philosophy? And the first question is, yes, I have had formal coach training. Two, no, but I think I know what coaching represents. Or three, this is a new concept for me. So like I was briefly stating, this is not a new idea, this idea of surgical coaching. So Atul Gawande, he published this article in, in The New Yorker back in 2011. And this article is very, it's so interesting and fascinating. And if you haven't read it, I urge you to, to um, take a moment and read it sometime this week. And what he does is he actually brings a surgical coach into his operating room to observe him, to take notes and to help him um, again, hone his skills, elevate his game, and not just surgical skills themselves, but also with ergonomics and use of his assistance and, and things like that. And it's really a remarkable, remarkable article. But the question is, is, how do you take this idea of surgical coaching and how do you actually implement it or integrate it into your practice? So um, answers are in. So are you familiar with coaching principles? 12% um, said, yes, I've had formal coach training before. 51% said, no, but I think I know what coaching represents. And then 37% of you said, this is a brand new concept for me. So this is awesome. I can't wait to dive into this with all of you guys. So when I hear surgical coaching, when I think, when I talk about surgical coaching, oftentimes what I hear from many people is, oh yeah, coaching. I do that all the time already. It's a great idea. I'm already doing it. I love it. My learners love it. Thank you. This is great. 
But what I want to really point out today is that coaching is actually unique and quite different from being a mentor, from being a sponsor, and from being a teacher. It's unique. So I'm not saying that mentors and sponsors and teachers aren't absolutely essential in our professional development. And all three of these, all four of these different roles, I think are critical in, again, enhancing our skills. Um, but what I want to really point out is that coaching is actually very unique from these things. So coaching is um, a philosophy that actually is very future focused. So it is really based on asking open ended questions. It's enabling this sense of self discovery. It's helping to dispel false feelings and beliefs. So with coaching, we try to keep it also a flattened hierarchy. So the coaching that I talk about a lot with the Academy for Surgical Coaching is this peer coaching model where it's a flattened hierarchy. And really um, it's one-on-one -on -one and really, again, looking forward, um, asking these open-ended questions for a real true self-reflective process to, to improve your skill. Now, if you think about it with a teacher, there's oftentimes a hierarchy there, right? Teachers oftentimes ask very directed questions. Teachers are there to provide information. So if, um, if the student doesn't know an answer, the teacher is oftentimes there to, to provide that answer. And they're oftentimes looking for very specific answers. Now, a mentor, again, there's oftentimes a hierarchy there, right? So mentors oftentimes are looking at past experiences to help their mentee look look in the future, but we're looking more on those past experiences. Now, all three of these roles are supporting development. That's crucial for, for us to remember, but coaching is actually a very unique part of this entire picture. So some de definitions that I really love for coaching is that a coach unlocks a person's potential to maximize their own performance. Coaches are there to help an individual learn rather than teaching them. I love this line. I'm going to say it one more time because I really think this encompasses what a coach is. They help an individual learn rather than teaching them. And they're there to provide objective and constructive feedback to help someone recognize what works and what can be improved. Now, with coaching, there's an actual mind shift that happens. Now, if you think about as surgeons, we're actually not used to this. As surgeons, we are, tip, we are oftentimes the experts in the room, right? If we're in the OR, we are looked on for all the answers, right? If, if things go wrong in the operating room, they look at us to be the expert. And so this is actually a very unique and such a magical shift when we do this coach training. So to, to, to really understand this coaching mind shift, I do think it takes some pretty serious faculty development to understand how to switch from this expert role to this learner role. You go from advocating to really inquiring. And with the Academy of Surgical Coaching's um, coach training, which I'll talk about momentarily, we teach you guys how to go from initial inquiry to this deeper inquiry to this, to this guided inquiry. And as people make this shift into this coaching mind shift, I, I oftentimes say be curious because it's really about being curious. It is so cool to see this relationship just explode. It's just it's it's so it's so fun to watch. So, so just as an example, so let's say you're coaching someone and you're seeing that they're standing, let's say they should be on a step, but they're not on steps. So instead of saying, you know, you really shouldn't stand like that, you should really have an extra step there because of X, Y, Z, which is oftentimes how we're used to conversing maybe with our residents um, or with our fellows. It's a little tweak, like here I noticed your elbow was really high, which made it difficult for you, for you to X, Y, Z. How did you feel about that? So it's more of, it's more of a framing of how you're giving feedback that's encouraging the self-reflective process and letting your coachee really um, come to their own conclusions and also work with the, with the resources and equipment they have to make solutions and actually implement it into their practice. Now, what's really neat about coaching as well, is it's not just technical skill. So oftentimes when we think about coaching, it's um, about maybe how to do a better you know, TLH, how to do a better uh, hysterectomy. And technical skill is definitely a part of this, where we talk about psychomotor or exposure or approach or how to use assistance. But you can also coach in so many other areas that you just can't hit upon with the evaluations that we currently use. So there's this cognitive role, right? Decision-making, situational awareness, judgment, I love doing coaching within this area, especially for my fellows, because it's really hard to tap in where someone, where their head is at when they're making decisions, you know, throughout a procedure. So this cognitive area is a really neat area that coaching can really excel in. There's also interpersonal coaching, communication, leadership, teamwork, and then maybe how to be a better teacher in the, in the operating room. And then stress management. 
So how do people handle stress when things aren't going smooth? How, how is your coachee um, still communicating with the anesthesiologist or how are they um, utilizing their assistant and then coping strategies? Now, when I talk about coaching, what I'm really talking about within the Academy for Surgical Coaching's model is video-based coaching. So the type of coaching that we oftentimes talk about is this one-on-one -on -one relationship, and it's, a, and it's an extended relationship. And it can be three months, six months, 12 months, as long as the coachee desires it. So with coaching, it is really at the service of your coachee. The coachee drives this relationship. Now, this can be in-person or virtual video review. We really um, we enjoy doing one on one in person, but with this whole pandemic, um, we've really moved to all virtual and what we have found is it is just as meaningful and has worked exceptionally well. These coaching sessions are usually about 45 minutes to 60 minutes and the frequency of the sessions is really based on the surgeon coachee. Now we really love video coaching. This is our preferred method. And there's a couple of reasons why we really love the video review coaching method. So number one, it allows the surgeon to review their own performance with a different lens, right? So when you're, when you're being coached real time in the OR, your brain isn't all there and you have a different lens on what you're doing. We have found that this video review after allows a stress-free, neutral environment and really gives a new lens to your own performance. We also found that video is more efficient, right? Time is a huge barrier to surgical coaching, right? We're all so incredibly busy already that video is, has found to be more efficient and it also allows undivided attention. So again, when you set out 45 minutes, you can shut your pager off, you can focus right in on what, on what, on what this coaching session is all about. And so we found that it, again, is more efficient and more meaningful with, with the video review. And within that video review, we know this actually dictates outcomes. So in this New England Journal of Medicine article that came out by Berkmeyer et al. in 2015, um, it's really a landmark paper. And what it showed was that with video grading based on OSATs and post-operative complications is that they're directly associated. So we know that video review is directly associated with complications and outcomes. So how do you integrate this into your everyday practice? Because again, we are exceptionally busy and so making this really easy to, to integrate is crucial for the sustainability of this. So this is my, my question number three to everybody. So um, my question for you guys is at baseline, do you record your surgeries? So answer one is always, two, sometimes, three, never, but mainly because I'm not interested, or four, never, but it's mainly because I don't have a way to actually record. So I am lucky that this picture here is my Cleveland Clinic video room. I know I'm, I'm so lucky here. I have so many resources. I mean, look where I am right now. I totally get it. But I'm very lucky that all of our operating rooms um, automatically record. They go right to, this, my, to, my, to my video room, my media room, and then all of my videos just get pushed onto my, onto my flash drive that's encrypted. So I'm lucky that I do record every single surgery. So um, our results are in. So do you record your surgeries? 14% uh, said always, 44% said sometimes, 3% said no, it's because I don't want to, and 39% of you said never, um, but it's because I don't have a way to record. So that's something that, um, that we can uh, brainstorm and work on. So we can uh, make it accessible for, for everyone to, to, to record their surgeries. So recording every case uh, or some cases that you wanna be coached on, I think is important. And then surgeon and coach pairing. Now this is crucial. So you really need an optimized match. And this is critical because you really need to have a level of psychological safety for this one-on-one -on -one coach pairing to work. If you don't feel like it's a psychologically safe place for coaching, it's, it's like I said, not going to work. To really make gains in your practice, you have to be really vulnerable. And this can be scary, right? Sharing with somebody, your real-time OR footage, and maybe in, you know, in cases that didn't go as well as you had hoped, this takes a huge level of vulnerability and courage and, and a good match to happen. Now, what I really think is interesting about coaching as well is this doesn't have to be in the same subspecialty. So the first time that I had a surgical coach, it was actually with a general surgeon, and my goal for our coaching session was to have um, my coach help me become a better uh, uh, teacher and a better uh, use of my assistance. And it was really neat because he had never seen an ovarian cystectomy before. I was doing like, I think a dermoid, which he thought was disgusting and amazing. But his eyes was a whole new lens, right? Because he wasn't just, you know, he hadn't seen the procedure before. So with the lens of just being truly curious, his questions were remarkable. His insight was exceptional because he wasn't just on autopilot seeing a regular ovarian cystectomy, which we all do every single week, right? And so I think depending on what your goals are, 
having a coach outside your specialty can actually be really powerful. I also really like this because it ba breaks down the barriers of different subspecialties. I think coaching is really neat and that it can, again, break down those silos, really make an amazing multi-disciplinary um, dis dis type team um, that can make everybody right, raise up. And so, again, a really neat part of coaching. And then you really need this flattened hierarchy. And so making a really highly efficient, highly safe surgeon and surgeon coach pair is really crucial in having this and having this work. Now you don't only have to do this just peer to peer in regard to your colleagues. I also have a fellowship coaching curriculum um, implemented and integrated within my within my um, uh, fellowship here. We do one session per month. So I do an hour session per month with, with each of my fellows. And, um, and it's a really neat way, again, to kind of gauge insight on decision making, um, on, on, on like stress management. Um, for instance, if they get into a little bit of bleeding, it's interesting to see how they handle that on video versus in real time. So this isn't just for when you're out in practice, but you can also integrate it into fellowship curriculum, into residency curriculum, um, wherever you're doing teaching. And with these coaching principles, again, getting creative, you can also implement this just into, into daily interactions um, with colleagues or with teaching or with your partner at home. I'm pretty sure these coaching principles have saved my marriage a few times, getting curious. Um, so I think not only can this be useful when you're doing a coaching, like a one-on-one -on -one coaching session, but just in interactions in life. It, it's really interesting when you, when you shift this um, to use these principles. And so what we talk about a lot in our, in our coach training sessions um, is this, um, these four big pinnacles. So we have facilitate goal setting, and then we um, uh, talk about guided inquiry. So how do you view a video with a surgeon coachee and really try to tap into that deeper inquiry, ask the right questions to really drive a self-reflective process in your coachee. Again, you are, at, you are at service to your coachee. And then we talk about how to provide constructive feedback, and then you facilitate action planning. And this is um, what we really break down each one-on-one -on -one coaching section, session to really hold. And this is where the magic really happens. Now, again, we really like this virtual platform. We think it's really easy for both the surgeon and surgeon coach. Um, and, and also you can make this uh, international, right? So for the, with the Academy for Surgical Coaching, we have people from all over the globe that are part of this. And we're matching coaches from, um, again, all over the globe. And it makes for a really unique and unifying experience. It allows simultaneous viewing of surgical videos. And um, there's different virtual platforms that we're currently integrating within the Academy that you also can document these goals and the feedback and the action planning steps right into the platform. Um, we're also working on integrating artificial intelligence to identify specific, cr specific critical steps of, of certain procedures. And again, what we're trying to really focus on is time efficiency. We know that as surgeons, we don't have a lot of time. And so we're really working with various platforms to make it easily accessible, HIPAA compliant, documentation right within it, and then, and then integration of AI within those platforms. So I want to bring up the Academy for Surgical Coaching. So this is my passion. This is my baby. This is where I devote almost all of my non-clinical time. So the Academy for Surgical Coaching was started by Dr. Caprice Greenberg, who is in the top left picture, and Dr. Suda Kwame, who's on the other side of me in that picture. Um, they were um, both based out of the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Um, Caprice is actually, she just accepted a job down in Georgia, which she'll be the chair. She's moving uh, next month. Um, and so this is a nonprofit organization that we actually just got up and running uh, just over a year ago. November was our one year anniversary. Um, and we are so proud of this. So this is the board. Um, and what we really are here for is to um, do a few different things. Number one, we are, we are here to help faculty development in regard to how to, how to become a coach. So again, making this, this shift to this coaching mind shift, it takes work. And so we're really here to help coach people, train people how to, how to be surgical coaches. We also are there to match one on one. So what we're doing is we're taking people who are interested in being coached, we interview them, and then we actually introduce them to a couple of different coaches that fit what we think that they may want. We facilitate these. It's almost like speed dating, right? We do some speed dating between the coach and the coachee. We find a great match and then we help um, um, get these the coach and coachee together on our virtual platform. And we're there to help in any way that, that, that our coach and coaches want. So sometimes they want us to sit in on their, coach, on their coaching sessions to uh, maybe help with a difficult scenario or just enhance their coaching um, technique. So we're there to help facilitate all of that. 
We're also um, here to go to different academic centers and help different centers get coaching programs up and running. So a lot of times we will go into a certain um, academic center, maybe coach three, four, five um, faculty to be the surgeon coaches at their institution and then serve as a surgeon coach for different people in their department. So again, we're here to train, we're, help, we're here to help um, with the virtual platform, we're here to help match some high quality coach and coaching um, pairs. And again, we're nonprofit. So um, all the money that I make as a surgical coach, I put right back into the academy and then we give it out for scholarships for people who can't afford it. So um, it's, it's been a blast, a lot of fun, and I'd love to talk about it um, with you guys if you're interested in, in more details. So with this being said, I think it's time to disrupt and replace um, what we're already doing. We're spending a lot of money and a lot of time on um, things that I don't think are very sustainable in regard to adult learning and really enhancing our surgical skills. Right now, we're actually working to um, build this within the ABMS. Um, so the American Board of, um, of Medical Specialties, we're making this actually part of continuing board certification. And so I think this is a crucial, a crucial time where we're really at the tipping po point where surgical coaching is going to be integrated um, into this, um, this long-term continuing board certification. We're also working on integrating this into surgical societies. So what we envision is having these speed dating type of relationships at surgical societies to do some really great um, coach pairing, also doing a lot of coach um, training at these societies. What, what we envision that is that participants will then record their surgery, they will do some virtual coaching sessions, and then they'll uh, meet one-on-one -on -one live during the, the uh, societies that they're already going to. Granted, we've been on a little bit of a pause for this, but what we envision is really integrating virtual coaching sessions with live coaching sessions and having this be very much a self-fulfilling prophecy. And again, I think that we are really on the cusp of a sustainable way where not only are we benefiting surgeons, right? Surgeons obviously are getting benefits from this because of the, the direct feedback that they're getting from the coach. We're also seeing great benefits for the coach. Coaches love this. It's, it really helps form these one-on-one -on -one relationships. You know, a lot of us are at multiple different hospitals. A lot of us don't really have meaningful relationships, maybe with a lot of people we work with. You know, we're all really, really busy. And what we have found is this is actually decreasing burnout. It's decreasing workplace loneliness. It's breaking down silos between subspecialties. And it's really enhancing job satisfaction. And the ultimate reason we're doing this for, for, for all of us is really to optimize patient care. And what we're really here for is to see our surgical skill go to the next level. So poll question number four. I'm just curious from you guys. Um, are you guys interested in future, future surgical coaching opportunities? I'm just curious what, you're, what you guys are thinking. So um, answer uh, uh, A is yes as a surgeon coachee, B yes as a surgical coach, C yes as both a surgeon coachee and a surgical coach, or nope, not right now. So um, yeah, what I'm really hoping is that we can um, talk about a lot of these um, different, you know, philosophies that, that, that I brought up, um, brought up over the past half hour and, um, and answer any questions that you guys have. Uh, so the answers are in and 32% of you said yes, I'd like to be a surgeon uh, coachee. 5% uh, says yes, I'm interested in becoming a surgical coach. 44% said, yes, I'd love to be a surgeon coachee and a surgical coach. And that's my favorite place too. I, I, I really think that even experts can be a coachee. Um, it's amazing, even different areas other than technical skill that it can really elevate your game. And then 20% said, no, not right now. So that's all I got you guys. So in summary, surgical coaching has the potential to bridge the gap in residency training and continuous practice development. Uh, faculty development and coaching techniques can enhance surgical education and satisfaction for both sides, the coach and the coachee. And I really think that the time is now. It's time to evaluate, disrupt, and really enhance the current surgical education and professional development activities that we're currently doing. So that is my talk for today. Um, my podcast has a great interview with Dr. Caprice Greenberg. So if you're interested, check it out and, and listen to Caprice talk about surgical coaching a bit. And then surgical coaching um, website is there on the right. So thank you. Let's open it up to some questions. Great. Thank you so much, Kara. I just want to make sure that uh, you can hear me. Yeah. Perfect. Well, yeah, that was fantastic. Um, you know, I was so excited to have you uh, start the year off because I think we need some disruption. I think you hit it. Um, you hit my main concern for surgeons and practicing physicians over this past year is a little bit of that loneliness I was that you had mentioned the 
feeling like you're doing great work uh, and at work you have so many people around but when you stop and you think about the day as you get home you know who do you debrief with i know early in my career uh perhaps more a colleague i remember talking every night after our cases we would chat about and certainly with uh, my fellows or my mentors my fellowship directors in the past i had that opportunity but during the pandemic it became really hard so i think you know, it was just an incredible opportunity to hear from you. And uh, I hope that the uh, participants enjoyed it as much as I did. So I think I'll go ahead and get started with some uh, comments uh, or questions as well. Um, one of the main things that comes up is, I don't know if you touched on it because I was trying to keep notes, but if I wanted to become a coach or uh, wanted to improve some of my skills, you know, is there a course um, and directly how can I do that? Because I, I think you talked about the Academy of Surgical Coaching, but can you describe the process? Fantastic. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. So yeah, right now with the Academy, we are doing all of our coach training programs virtual. So there's no more in person for the time being. We're, we have usually um, one coach training program once every two or three months. So our next coach training is this Friday, actually, January 15th. We may have one or two openings left. We cap it pretty low. We cap it at usually 15 or 17, just because we want to keep it really interactive. So right now, um, our next one is going to be in March. And what it, what it includes is usually a five-ish hour didactic, very interactive. But what we're doing is teaching these coaching principles, this coaching philosophy. We do a lot of practice between different people that are, that are there at the virtual session. And then after that, we do one hour, one-on-ones, ideally within the next one, two, three weeks where we actually watch you do a one-on-one -on -one session with somebody that was in the class with you. And what we do is we just talk you guys through it. We give you a scaffolding of how to do these coaching sessions. We're there to give feedback. After that, if you wanna become a certified coach with the Academy, you have the ability to do so. You let us know that you wanna be coaching, you wanna be a coach through the Academy and we list you as an available coach. From there, we match coaches with you. So if you wanna be a coach, then we match coaches with you. You tell us how much time you have to do this and we pay you for your time. We very much value each and every coach. So if it's something that you're interested in, we, we will pay you for your time. So uh, go on to your website, Academy of Surgical Coaching, and uh, then we can take a look at all the options that are there. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I'm just gonna ask Marae to put both of us uh, together on our view so that we have a split screen during the discussion, if you don't mind, Marae. Uh, as we're doing that, I'll ask you the next question. Uh, I think I already know the answer to this. Can Canadian fellows, because um, we have a few fellows on, online, get involved or enrolled with the Academy as well? Great question. The short answer is yes, absolutely. So we would love to have fellows involved in our coach training. Like I said, I think this is extremely powerful, not only in these one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions, but just when you coach or interact with other fellows or your residents or your medical students. So we're currently not allowing fellows to be a certified coach through the academy. Like we don't match um, people who wanna be coached with a fellow, but as soon as you graduate to attending, um, then you can be a certified coach through the academy. But you absolutely at this time can go through our coach training. Fantastic. Um, the next comment uh, or question um, is when you do do your recording and uh, again, being part of the fellowship, we've been recording for many, many years. Uh, we have a special consent uh, process at the Ottawa hospital that we get everybody to sign. Part one is that it's okay to just hit record. Um, and uh, part two is if we ever wanted to share it or publish it, they have to sign a separate form. What is your process? Yeah, you're exactly right. Our process is also built into our surgical consent. So within our surgical consent and what we encourage our coaches is to build it into your consent, saying that it's OK for learning and educational purposes. So um, that way that that we can share it as long as, again, it's all HIPAA compliant platforms, which it is. And the companies that we're working with, actually, they use AI to um, blur if, for instance, you get any nurses' faces in the screen or uh, you take your scope out to clean and you may get the patient's face or something, it automatically blurs that out. So it's totally HIPAA compliant. You don't have any face recognition. We keep it very safe. So um, we'd love to learn more about that company. If you can share that with us um, in the future, it'd be great to know because I don't think, I don't certainly have that set up and uh, it would be important if we're going to continue this kind of work. Um, do you have a good read for basic coaching skills? So there's the course, which again, just to clarify, because I've looked into it, 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 you do have to pay a tuition fee to sign up for the course. Uh, I think it's a great investment, 
but let's say somebody just wanted to read on their own. Is there a, a book or a good basic, um, you know, uh, yeah. podcast you can suggest even? <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a great question. Um, so I would honestly just go Peb, PubMed search Caprice Greenberg. Her work, she's been doing work within surgical coaching for the past twenty years, and a lot of her um, a lot of her publications actually talk about just that, like coaching theory. And she brings up like the goal setting, the the, the guided inquiry, the uh, feedback, and the action planning. So she goes into that quite a bit. I think that's probably where I would start. Um, and I can actually look at other resources and I can send them to you, Sony, if I find anything else that would be really helpful. Yeah, I think that would be great because um, we can add it to the live recording that we have. And uh, then that way we can um, share it with others as well. <clears throat> uh, the, we have a great question from uh, Sam, who's from St. Mike's. Uh, she's one of the fellows there in minimally invasive gynecology. Great group. Um, they, she's asking, when you record the surgeries, do you ever actually record the environment as well? And I know why, it's kind of a loaded question, because uh, as you know, there's a Canadian invention called the OR Black Box. Um, the SAGES team, with C which is a CMPA uh, subsidiary, uh, is involved in this as well, looking at how we can use it for safety. But education is a, a key point. So have you ever recorded the environment as well as the OR and reviewed that? Great question. Yeah, Black Box is awesome. I just I was just speaking with them a couple of weeks ago. Um, so the short answer is yes, absolutely. So we actually think that's really critical for different areas of coaching as well. The, the parts of video that we review are really based on what the coachee wants to get out of the relationship, right? So if the goal of the coachee is, let's say, communication with the operating room or ergonomics or, or setup or communication with the anesthesia team, then we absolutely want that room recording. Um, so I think uh, the recording that is reviewed within re each relationship is really based on what the coachee's goals are. But yes, absolutely. Perfect. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, see, uh, let's see, the time. Oh, we still have good time here. <clears throat> How much experience do coaches usually have? That's a really good question. It's a great question. And my short answer is you do not have to be an expert to be a coach. So I get this a lot, right? Like, do I have to be an expert to actually go through your coach training? The short answer is no. I mean, especially if you think about um, like athletics coaching or, you know, other areas outside of medicine. I mean, how many coaches are actually experts in whatever they're coaching? Not, not that often, right? And so I think um, to have the eye for, it's, it's, really, it's really the eye for detail to be a good coach and to be curious. I know that sounds kind of cliche maybe, but actually just being curious about each procedure, having a lens that you're genuinely asking questions and inquiring about it, that's really, really where a coach excels. And it's interesting, um, Caprice Greenberg always says this, you know, the best coaches, if you think about it, so think about um, the person that you call when you get into trouble. So that really amazing consultant that can come into the OR, not make you feel judged, right? Not make you feel bad for whatever situation that you're in, that person's oftentimes a really fantastic coach. So, so those type of characteristics, you know, being humble, um, attention to detail, being curious, being at the service of your coachee. You don't have to be an expert in your field though, necessarily. I do wanna share a personal experience and reason why your work has uh, been very helpful is I was asked recently to coach and you're right, um, it's a very different experience. They're not a fellow, uh, they're a colleague and trying to work with them, um, but it's all about them. And uh, I love that. It, um, the key points that I found were very helpful that I picked up on in previous lectures by you were being inquisitive, asking yes. questions, trying to, um, rather than trying to be somebody who provides solutions. So as a coach, the rewarding part of it was that you don't have to have all the answers. There's a bit of freedom there. You're not there to save the day, uh, but rather you're there to help a colleague and you're genuinely interested in them doing better. And so I think there's a, it's a totally different concept uh, than, like you said, being a direct mentor or evaluator, et cetera. Um, when you started this, do you have an example of where you found it very helpful, like where you really felt that you made an impact? Yeah. You know, it's funny you brought that up. Just go back one second, because one of the hardest things about my coaching relationships oftentimes is that people just want to know, how do you do this? How do you do this? How do you do this? Right? So sometimes I'll be coaching and uh, someone had to do a TLH and they always want to ask me, well, what instrument do you use? Or how do you do this? Or how do you cut this? Or what? And to try to break that in your coaching relationship is really interesting, because just like you said, that's teaching 
or that's mentoring. That's not necessarily coaching. And so um, that's one thing that comes up a lot is that how do you divert those questions so you're not just teaching? Because your coach is going to be asking you that a lot. So it's just interesting that you brought that up. You're right. It's a different hat. Yeah. So yeah, I have a yeah a funny example is I do, like I said, a ton of these coaching sessions. And it was actually um, a couple weeks ago where I was just role playing actually for one of my colleagues. She was training to be a coach and um, I was just playing coachy for her. I wasn't actually in a real session, um, but I was just playing the part so she could practice coaching. Um, but when I was playing the part, I was just showing a real video of mine and I showed, I was just talking about like a real goal of mine. And all of a sudden it turned into a real coaching session which I, without me even meaning to have it go there. Um, and it was amazing at how it has actually changed the way that I actually educate my fellows. It just came up, I was having a difficult time um, knowing when to like take the case back over. Um, we got into some discussion about how I use a super pubic port and I wasn't sure how to integrate that nicely with my fellows. And the self-reflection that she made me do, um, like for instance, she said, you know, if you have somebody, why not just put an extra five millimeter port, give them an epsilateral port, would that mess with X, Y, or Z? Just having the self-reflective nature on things that I thought I was already set in. I wasn't even considering adding an extra five millimeter port for my assistant. Or um, for instance, she said, why don't you email, you know, your resident the night before and maybe lay out some expectations to make the day go smoother. Just little things that I thought I was set in my ways that she made me reflect on. Um, it's just so interesting, the advances you can make in areas that you didn't even know that you had uh, questions about, if that makes sense. No, that's fantastic. It's a, you know, I think we're all going to learn as we go and we're hopefully going to, you know, just like we share that tough case, uh, you know, I had a parametrial nodule, I almost cut the ureter, you know, <laughs> in a couple of years will be, you know, um, I was being coached and uh, I was really struggling and this is my coach just said one word and it made me reflect or vice versa. Um, so I think that's fantastic. We're going to have a different discussion. Um, there's a question by, I think, somebody who is a fantastic uh, coach, educator, uh, Niraj Mira from uh, UBC, who says sports coaching and leadership coaching are two different things. How does surgical coaching compare? Is it elements of both? So some of the technical skills, some of the, the mental rehash is what I think he's getting at. How, how do you sort of yeah. put, where do you put surgical coaching along that line? Or is yeah. it all one? Yeah, no, that's a fantastic question. And it's so funny you brought it up because my surgical um, coaching board, we just talked about this like two weeks ago. It's actually a hot thing amongst my teammates and how um, sport coaching is actually not very consistent with what we do, to be honest with you. We bring up sports coaching a lot as our as you know, as a comparison, but we actually had a really deep conversation about this where um, sport coaching is kind of um, it's, there's a lot of teaching going on, right? Like you mess up on the field, like you may get yelled at and we tell you how that it should be done, right? So sports coaching, I think it's actually less sport coaching and probably more leadership coaching, some elements of both. Um, but uh, if you brought this up with Caprice um, and Suda and some of my other team members right now, we would probably say it's not very much sport coaching, even though we've talked about that in the past, we're actually moving away from that analogy and moving more into this um, like self-reflective, more like more leadership type coaching. That was a great question. So just let me go along that line where uh, Niraj was going. But uh, you know, I've I've actually been uh, sponsored to have a life coach, maybe that yes. <laughs> from my department in the past. Maybe they were telling me something, but I found <laughs> it really helpful um, because uh, you know planning career and uh, making you know uh, trying to figure out where you're going and making decisions. Um, for example, not pushing myself into administration was a huge decision that I, I wanted to make and I made. Um, so from your perspective, is, is that more in keeping with the coaching? So we know we talked about leadership coaching, how to become a leader, see that yeah. a bit more aggressive than perhaps a life coach who kind of reflected more. It was my homework. It was my thoughts. So I see this almost yeah. like a, a life coaching sort of pr principle because yeah. of the communication aspects you were talking about. That's a, it's a great analogy. Yeah. You know, again, at service to the coachee and the coachee does the work, right? They go back and they integrate the work. Um, what I think is really important too, is that when you work with your coachee, you're integrating the resources that they already have, right? So if they, if, you know, sometimes if they're looking at my videos, a lot, a lot of times my coachee will say, well, can you, can you show me a video of you doing this X, Y, or Z? 
And some aspects that may be helpful, but not always, because I have resources that they may not have. So if I teach them how to use this needle and this needle driver and this bag, but they don't have that when they go home, that's not really helping them, you know? So yeah, I like that analogy too, in that it's a self-reflective um, self-work and then using the resources that they have at hand in their institution, yeah. I do have a hard question for you because uh, we, we don't want to leave you easy. But before we go that uh, route, um, just a reminder to everybody that you can get this online later on. We're going to record it. Please complete the session evaluation and you do get Royal College credits. This is part of our COVID series for education because we have had to recreate how we teach. Now, my tougher question is, tell me about the time when coaching just doesn't uh, work with an individual. So we're, we're a person that really uh, perhaps needs some guidance and coaching would do them well, but they're, they're not in, into that. Yeah. Um, you know, and I can think of many examples of personalities or individuals who, um, you know, don't necessarily uh, want your help because they haven't perhaps um, realized what they are missing or need. So tell me about a tough time that you had. Yeah, yeah, I can tell you about a few of those. So I, I will say that that coaching can't be as a punishment. Like it can't, be, you can't fear retribution from coaching, if that makes sense. So it's, it's really hard to take someone who's had maybe a lot of complications in the OR and you make them go to a coach. And then they're, if you don't have that psychological safety and if they're worried about opening up to you, it's, it's not gonna work, right? And so what we have found is that that person has to want to be there. They can't be fearful of retribution. They can't be fearful if they show you where they've messed up or had issues that that's gonna come back and get them. Um, and again, they have to have that level of psychological safety and, um, and confidence that what you say during that session won't get out. So the times that I've had really a difficult time coaching it, um, is just that, where people who come in and think that they don't, they don't need it, they don't want it, um, they're almost defensive, and, um, and then the dialogue just doesn't work. Now, how do you combat that? The ways that I've combated that is just um, really do my best to be non-judgmental and to allow that space where um, they can be vulnerable. And sometimes it has taken a few sessions to have that person open up. Um, and it's interesting, the first few coaching sessions are oftentimes um, in these type of relationships where they'll show me videos that everything went perfect, right? They're showing me like the best of their best videos. And it's interesting, as you get a few coaching sessions in and you build that space where they know that they're safe, then they'll start showing videos that they actually want help in, where they actually need some work. Um, but I would say the more, the more difficult relationships are when people, A, maybe feel they don't need it, or B, don't really wanna be there, or they're fearful of actually opening up. Um, and, and sometimes the coaching relationship doesn't work. Like I said, they, they have to want to be there. But I think with the right um, um, reflective nature with your questions and just being really inquisitive, not judgmental, just really curious and inquisitive, you can make, you can make some gains, but sometimes it can take some time. One of the things that uh, I think I found very helpful was to separate being the department head as a coach yeah. or somebody who uh, is responsible for privileging or legal issues. And I, I thought that's an important aspect. I don't know if you can comment on as our last comment, just separating yourself from the medical legal part. Because one of the questions was, have you ever seen a video where you're really concerned about the competence of the surgeon? Um, and I would argue that in a true coaching relationship, if they were open enough to show you, you should be frank enough, say, look, um, you know, I'm concerned with uh, how you're performing there. You know, what are your thoughts and how are we going to look to move forward? But if you're the one who's also in charge of their privileges or the legal issues, it ain't going to work, right? Yeah, no, you nailed it. And that's why if you have the capabilities of having coaching, sometimes not within your institution, that can actually be helpful, right? So if we match you to someone who doesn't have that that type of power in your institution, that can sometimes be a lot a lot more at ease for the coachee. Um, you're right though. Have I seen videos where I'm like, wow, that can be kind of nerve wracking. I have, I'll be absolutely honest, right? Um, and I think just learning how to word those things like, well, like, wow, I mean, we've all gotten a lot of bleeding before. When I get into that much bleeding, that makes me really nervous. What were you feeling then? Like just trying to like frame it in a way that's like humbling, we've all been there, but like, that's not good. And like, if you don't know that's not good, then like we have some more work that we need to do. 
Um, I feel like you're funny. talking about the video that I just sent you. Uh, you know, <laughs> I will. I think I recognize that I need to improve in that way. Thank you so much for the feedback. We've um, all been there, Sony. I'm yes. not going to lie. <laughs> I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. King, Dr. Kara King. Um, you know, you're a fantastic surgeon. You're an educator. Um, you're well, a great runner. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll be running running uh, together, hopefully, at, when we finally do get to meet. Uh, and I want to thank all of you out there for attending. Without you, this this wouldn't happen. I'm so amazed by the turnout. And uh, as a plug, uh, Dr. King, do you want to say anything about the next speaker that I've invited uh, uh, next month, Dr. Ted Lee, who will be going over dissection? Do you think it's worth it to sign on for that? Oh my gosh, you guys, I cannot brag enough about Dr. Ted Lee. I was telling Sony before we started here, he trained me for two years. He is a surgical ninja. He literally is a magician. He um, is one of the most talented surgeons I've ever seen. He is one of my favorite humans. Watching him operate is, it's like a movie. So 100%, please tune in, watch him, learn from him. He's, he's just a surgical master, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to sign off now. Uh, Academy of Surgical Coaching, uh, Dr. Kara King, please visit the website. Um, look for some Canadian involvement, uh, which I've just touched upon uh, using the word sages and uh, CMPA. And of course, CanSage, which I think should be the leader in this area. So thank you all. And we have a great night and we look forward to uh, seeing you next month uh, for the next talk. Thank you. Thank you. It was an honor. Take care, everyone.